It's great to see Johnny. It is a little intimidating. I feel like uh, we got the order wrong, you know. The opening band is usually the amateur, and then you're getting the pro up here. Amen. And uh, what, a, what a powerful word. I just wanted him to keep going. Amen. And it sounds like in a couple weeks he will be. Hallelujah. It's a privilege to be here, though, with you this morning. Hallelujah. And uh, I want to share with you, it's a message that some of it I've shared because it is my passion that I really felt God deal with me, amen? And so uh, if you've heard some of the stories and the jokes, laugh like it's the first time, hallelujah. And uh, I want to talk to you about what would, what would happen if Jesus was here, amen? You know, I have a feeling a few of us probably acted a little different just because Johnny's here, amen? Some of you probably wish you'd have come a little more on time, <laughs> He said, if I'd have known pastor was here, I would have been here a little earlier. Amen. Maybe you gave a little more than you planned on because you got convicted when it began to happen. Well, you know, if if Jesus were to show up, I think at the very least it would be memorable. It'd be an experience you'd never forget. It'd be like uh, when you won the lottery or, amen, or that big game or got uh, got asked out on the date you'd been praying about. And uh, we've all had those experiences, but... Part of it would be as I think Jesus many times would shake us up, would cause us to think in ways we haven't. I was thinking as I was uh, working on this and putting together an experience in my life, I had been pastoring for, oh, I don't even know, 12 years maybe or something. Uh, It was my fourth church. I was going to conference, and I had decided this time they weren't going to convict me. (laughs) You know, and uh, I, this was my third fourth church I had pastored. I'm in my fifth now. And conference was kind of designed back in those days. It was before Praise Chapel. It was in another group that I was affiliated with. And they would make you want to go somewhere and do something. And I had gone and done it more than anybody almost that I knew. And I went into conference, man, I'm cinched down. I'm going nowhere. But by about Thursday night, my conviction is high. I can't take it anymore. I went up to the leader of the fellowship, and and I said, okay, I want you just to know I'll do anything God wants wants me to. And I was just convinced that they would take my church, give it to somebody else, and say, okay, Ron, we knew you were going to finally do this. You're going to go to Somalia or something, you know. (laughs) And, 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 you know, I'm I'm just broken, and I'm waiting for this response that I just assume I'm going to get. And I'll never forget as long as I live. Amen. The pastor there looks at me with kind of this look of disgust. That was not what I was expecting, you know. I thought maybe we would shed a tear together, you know, that he would say something like, Ron, I've been waiting for you to respond. I I knew you would do this. But he looks at me and he goes, you know, Ron, what we call that? I said, what? He says, a Christian. And he just turned and walked off. And I was horrified <laughs> because he was right. <laughs> Here I am. Amen. All I'm thinking about is me. Amen. And I had lost track of really what a Christian was. Amen. And it is. Everything I have belongs to him. Amen. How could I, you know, think that this is my possession or something like this, and it was one of the greatest moments of my life. And I can't promise you that this morning, but hopefully we'll get you thinking a little. How many, amen, could think a little more? Hallelujah. Wave at me, amen, this morning. Well, you could turn to Matthew 20, or Matthew 7, verse 22. Jesus is a wild man. I don't know if you've figured that out, amen, and we've been trying to kind of communicate. Maybe Jesus is a little different. He's not as traditional. He's not as uptight as some Christians kind of think. He was a guy that would turn over tables sometimes. He was a guy that he said the unexpected. You know, the Pharisees would have been Time Magazine's man of the year, and uh, they looked good, but he was the one who said, you're like whited sepulchers. You're white on the outside, but you're trash on the inside. And here he preaches <laughs> a heavy word, Matthew 7, 22. Yeah, I'm reading, I think, out of the Message Bible I can see it now at the final judgment, thousands strutting up to me and saying, Master, 
We preached the message. We bashed the demons. Our God-sponsored projects had everyone talking. And you know what I'm going to say? You missed the boat. All you did was use me to make yourself important. You don't impress me one bit. You're out of here. <laughs> now that's preaching. <laughs> that's, that's, you know what? I, I had a feeling they never expected to hear that kind of a message there before. Well, there are four things I want you to live, think about with me this morning. I think if Jesus was here, he would, number one, tell you the truth. Amen. He would tell you the truth. Now, we think that's easy, and we all say, oh, I want the truth. You, do you really want the truth? Then why did you dye your hair this morning? Why did you lie to everybody when you came in? How, how are you doing? I'm doing great. <laughs> you know, and, and you're just barely holding back the tears. Amen. We, we all have a tendency to cover, and it's not all bad. It's not all wrong. It's not all something that's evil, but... Many of us are, are scared to death we're going to be exposed. Amen. One of the hardest things about pastoring and preaching is, is that uh, how can I communicate uh, life-changing truth, amen, without scaring everybody out of the building? Amen. That's why I kind of wrap it around a few jokes and a little comedy and then try to put the blade in. Amen. Give, my, give you my secret, amen, to preaching. Amen. Because people don't want to know the truth. At one of the first conferences I went to, amen, there was this guy that was there and, and uh, there were like a thousand people and hundreds of pastors and he called the first guy out, I'll never forget. I'm pretty sure it was Bob French. I don't know if Johnny was there back in those days, but he called the first guy out and he says to him, I see you in a motel room last night and you're with another woman. Says, and, you know, and this guy all of a sudden he goes, oh my God, he falls on the ground weeping and, and repenting and everybody is just shocked. Then he calls another guy out, it's something about like that, and I want to tell you, everybody in the building was headed for the restroom. <laughs> Nobody wanted a word, amen, no, oh, no, don't call me out, amen, and because we go out of our way, don't we, sometimes to not hear the truth. We pick churches because... Everybody looks like us and acts like us. Amen. Who can believe there would be biker churches? <laughs> and it's not bad, you know, but they want to they wanna go where they feel like they fit in. But if we're not very careful, what comes out of this is that uh, is we're terrorized of the truth. I remember the first time I went out to pastor, the first sermon I went, I was scared to death that, you know, I was going to give an altar call. And <laughs> what happens if they don't get saved? Have you ever thought, you don't even think about that, but I was, I was terrified. Wouldn't it be horrible? You come up, and finally they come up, and, and you pray with them, say this prayer, and then you look them in the eye, and you say, do you feel different? No. No, I, I feel worse. I remember when I got filled with the Holy Ghost, amen, and the first time I publicly prayed in the Spirit out loud, I thought for sure my pastor was going to come over and put his hand on my shoulder and say, would you stop that? <laughs> you know, the, the, you made that one up. We're afraid sometimes of the truth, aren't we? Wait, wave at me if you know. I'm telling you the truth, amen, as we begin to come. We do all kinds of things to do it. We surround ourselves with people. And if I'm really honest, I kind of love a good lie. Honestly, I, I kind of miss, Susie couldn't come, one of our boys is in the hospital, and it's, don't worry, he's all right, amen, in fact, it's kind of a wake-up call, it's probably a good thing that it happened, amen, but she's, she's with him this morning, but why I don't like her is because she lies to me all the time, <laughs> she'll probably say something when I get back, like, you know, did any of those women hit on you, Ron? <laughs> well, in all honesty, it's never been a big problem in my life. <laughs> Amen. But she'll say something like, you know, I mean, I know you were so sexy up there. <laughs> and and uh, I like it. Amen. Lie to me, baby. Lie to me. <laughs> and, you know, everything isn't wrong in this. There's something about some of you need to learn to not lie but to speak faith. To say what God says, not what you feel. To declare your new position in Christ, but it almost feels. To, to be more positive, to be more encouraging. 
Amen. But yet there is something seriously needed, amen, in us hearing the truth, amen, and coming uh, to a kind of thing. Uh, uh, because if not, we'll go to extremes to never hear the truth. And it's one of the saddest parts of being a pastor or a counselor. Is there are people that I know I can't tell the truth. There are people you just can't tell. If you tell them the truth, they're going to yell at you. They're going to accuse you. They're going to say horrible things about me. Amen. They're going to run out, and you may never see them again. Amen. Because there is something here that we have to understand. We need the truth. Look at the person next to you and say, you need the truth. You need the truth. Amen. And there's something here that's critical, which leads us to point two. If Jesus was here, he would tell us the truth. And the truth is, you're a mess. Look at the person next to you now and say, you're a mess. <laughs> you're a mess. <laughs> yeah, some of you enjoyed that way too much. I can tell already. Amen. You're a mess. But... But here is the very, very essence of the biblical story. We're the problem in creation. We're the cockroaches of creation. I mean, literally, the Bible says you, you can do nothing without Christ. Have you discovered that? It says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it's not just talking about Johnny. We know he was a mess. But even sweet Patty has had her bad days. Hallelujah. Amen. Though she's shaking her head. Maybe not. Don't, don't yell at me, Patty. I love you, Patty. Amen. Here's the heaviest revelation that I ever got in my life. And probably there are some here this morning that need to come to it. I need a Savior. I need a Savior. That, that even today as I stand here, probably doing better than I've ever done in many ways. Love Christ with all of my heart. I still need a Savior. Amen. Because I'm a mess. Amen. I don't want to be, but I'm broken. Amen. And I'm headed towards heaven. And we're headed towards something that changes everything. And when we act like we're in better shape than we are, we become what we fear, hypocrites. We become those that many times, amen, are afraid to come to the knowledge and the fullness of what God is. See, here's maybe the heaviest thing I can tell you. Amen. Uh, God knows you. And he's not freaked out by who you are. He's not freaked out by the fact that some of your thoughts aren't perfect. That maybe you've made some mistakes this week and some things have happened. He knows it before you know it. Amen. That doesn't excuse us. That doesn't mean that it doesn't matter. Absolutely. That's insane to even think. Amen. But the greatest story in the Bible is the story of the fact that God loves messed up people. Amen. The prodigal son. What a powerful picture. Even today, it's a radical story. But can you imagine in the culture of the Jews where there was no grace, where they picked up stones and they, and they stoned even their own children if they caught them in sin. Amen. That if you were caught doing anything, judgment was the first thing that fell. That Jesus tells a story of a father that son has done everything to betray him, everything to disgust him, and yet the father stands looking, amen, to bring back the prodigal son or the woman caught in the act of adultery, amen, and that Jesus says, go sin no more, amen. He's there this morning, amen. And there's something here that we need to hear continuously. We need an encounter with a God that cares about us, amen, and forgives us, amen, and who understands we're all a little crazy. Amen. <laughs> Is that too heavy? Amen. I think I've told you about my great-grandpa, Ben, who would run and kiss every pretty girl on the television. Amen. Who, <laughs> who was just as mad as a hatter. I don't know why they let him go rabbit shooting. Amen. But my Aunt Pug... Amen. You can tell I'm a hillbilly. Amen. I actually have an Aunt Pug. And Aunt Pug went running back to the house to get something. And great grandpa Ben shot her. Thought she was a rabbit. <laughs> Luckily, it was just bird shot. 
Amen. But that's, that's my genes. Can you see it in me? Probably the best revival I ever had. I don't know if Johnny came. That may be the only church Johnny didn't preach at. Amen. It was in, it was in Tucson. I can't remember. I don't think you ever came there. And we were only two blocks from the insane asylum. Amen. And, and uh, they had a halfway house right next to the church. And half the church was on lithium. Amen. They'd shuffle in. But there was something about me they could relate to. But I want to tell you, some of you are doing better than those around you, but you're a mess and you need a Savior. Which leads us to the third point, and maybe the most important is, that even though the truth is we're a mess, God loves us. Look at the person next to you and say, God loves you. Amen. I think we often see Jesus as too, too disgusted, too angry, too mad. Amen. There was a time when I would see Jesus and he was like just spit coming out. You know what I mean? You're a sinner. You're a mess. You're a mess on something. You know, and I would be throwing myself on the carpet and repenting. But I have a different picture today of Christ. And I see him in a way probably that's totally different. I, I don't see him yelling or doing, but I, I just see him at saying the truth. You're a mess, but I love you. Amen. I probably told this picture before. The best I can think of is in our house, we have this little monster named Ned. We don't know what he is. It's a little tiny dog. Amen, Ned. And, uh, and, and, and he just poops and pees everywhere. He's Lord of the mansion. The good news is he's a little dog, so it's kind of little poop. Amen. <laughs> And it's livable. And, and I've seen Sue, I don't know how many times, holding, you know, Ned in her hand. Just petting Ned and saying, Ned, Ned, you're such a naughty dog. Such a naughty dog. But I love you. <laughs> but I love you. And I, I think when I see, see God, I think, him, I think he's that way. Amen. Amen. As, as, as he's got, I can just see him with Fred in his hand. And he's holding Fred. He's saying, Fred, you're such a naughty preacher. Such a naughty preacher. But I love you. But I love you. Amen. And, and, and if I think there is nothing more important than we understand this. And we need to hear this. And we need to hear what God is saying. In 1 John 4, 19, it says, we love him. Because he first loved us. Amen. What a revelation. I met a guy by the name of Argemero Figuero. He's, there's books written about him. He traveled the world. When I met him, this was 35 years ago. And he had been around the world, I think, 12 times at that time. Amen. He came. Our church was almost nothing. He was actually trying to kind of get our pastor, who was Ron Jones, to go with him and help him in his crusade ministry. And this guy was way beyond our pay grade. And I remember he rented a plane just to take me up for the very first time I ever went up in an airplane was with this guy, Argemero Figuero. And I asked him this question. I said, Argemero, what was the greatest service you were ever in? Without even hesitation, I never forget him looking at me. And he said, Ron, I was in Africa. I went to a country where the gospel probably had never been preached. That, that there were 70,000 people that were in the, that were waiting for me when he got there to preach. All of them were either were either Muslims or they were animists. It means that they, they, they had witch doctors. That was their only expression. And all they'd ever known is religion. And he said he stood up in front of that 70,000 people. There was not a doctor in the nation. There was only one nurse that was there for the whole country. And the place was filled with people that were blind and deaf and, 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 and had every ailment in the world. And there was no hope for them outside of a miracle. But he began to preach to them about a God who loved them. And he said they'd never heard that in all of their life. Can you imagine? We take it for granted. We've been raised in church. We sing Jesus loves you. Yes, I know. We don't understand how radical that message is, how every other religion in the world does not have a God of love, but has a God of obedience and a God of justice and judgment. And he said about 30 minutes into that message, all of a sudden it hit that crowd in such a way that God loved them 
that he said he was literally knocked onto his back and he wasn't able to stand up for 30 minutes. And waves of God began to run through that congregation and that crowd of people as they discovered God loved them. And eyes opened and ears unstopped. And he said it was one of the greatest experiences of his life. And all it was, was God's love. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And I want to tell you, some of you this morning, and I think it's why I'm here and why I want to preach this, is that you need to rediscover the fact that God loves you. We need to hear a fresh word from God. Amen. A fresh word that God cares about us. Amen. Oh, it's good to hear the truth. It's good to be challenged. It's good to be told some things. But it's good every once in a while when somebody says, Amen. You're a great man. Made me feel so good when Johnny said, my friend. Amen. Ron Simpkins. Amen. What, what, a, what an affirmation. What a statement that is. Hallelujah. And only if you knew Johnny would you know how powerful that can be. And what a friend. What a friend. And God is our friend. Two pictures that I think of when I think of this. Oh, there's so many. I can't even hardly do it. But Adam sinned. You know what, if Adam would have sinned, I'd have just started over. <laughs> you know, if I'd have been God. I wouldn't have gone looking, walking through the deal as Adam's out hiding in the bushes. Where are you, Adam? And yet God loved Adam and Eve, even when they did what he said they shouldn't do. Or a Peter betraying Christ. <sighs> and it's caused him to die on the cross. And all of a sudden... Can you imagine when he hears the voice he thought he would never hear again? Amen. They're out fishing. And there's bread and fish on the fire. And there's forgiveness. I tell my assistant pastor, I'm tired of betrayal. You betray me, I'll kill you. I'm not Jesus. Don't expect me. <laughs> but you know, God loves even those that have broken their promises. And that brings me to my conclusion. And here's the probably key point. Johnny set me up for this as he shared with you. The fourth point is be a blessing. Be a blessing. Look at the person next to you and say, be a blessing. Be a blessing. Even though you're a mess, you're loved, and you then can be a blessing. Abraham is a father of faith. He's really probably the first guy to get it right. In any way, in the Bible, when you read the story, and in Genesis 12, 2 and 3, it says, it says, I'll make you a great nation, and I'll bless you. I'll make you famous. You'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and those who curse you, I'll curse. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Jesus says to us this morning, you're a mess, but I love you, and you can still serve me, and you still need to serve me, even though you're messed up. Think of the 12 disciples. You know, my fear would have been if I'd have been there when Jesus was there, that my pastor would have been Judas. Wouldn't that have been a bummer? <laughs> Somebody ask you, who was your pastor? You know, you'd want to say Peter or John the Beloved, but I'd have probably had to say, well, you know, uh, Ju Judas was my pastor. <laughs> I know he made a couple of mistakes, but he he's a good preacher. You know what, but listen to this, Judas, nobody knew who he was, and he did great things, even though he was broken, amen. Messed up people can do good. The Bible's filled with the stories of Ruth, who's a Moabitess, amen, and who, who did all kinds of things, and yet handfuls on purpose, of Rahab, a harlot, who yet is in the very lineage of Christ, and who her redemption makes him of of the demoniac of Ontario, amen, we won't point you out, but you, we know you're here, amen, that, <laughs> that, I better leave that one alone, I don't know if I've told you, I'm going to get myself in trouble, I may not be here next Sunday, <laughs> hopefully it'll be though, because Johnny's going to preach, <laughs> but you know the first guy I got saved, at least I think it's the first one, it's the first one I know I got saved, I was drunk and high out of my mind. Yeah, I was a backslider. I was in a fraternity in Flagstaff, Arizona, and Randy Miller. I can give you his phone number. You can check this out if you want to know if it's true or not. <laughs> Two o'clock in the morning, bombed, 
Randy comes, and I was in the top bunk there, sharing a room with Joe Whitinger. And he wakes me, and, well, he didn't wake me up. I was just kind of, I don't know, half conscious. And he says, Ron, I got to get right with God. <laughs> I said, Randy, I'm loaded. He said, no, you've got to pray with me. You've got to pray with me. I, I, I can't take it any longer. You're the only Christian I know. I said, <laughs> I, I said Randy, I, I'm not a Christian. <laughs> you know, I'm not a Christian. He says, well, you're the best I've got. <laughs> so thank God I was smart enough that I got down on my knees next to him, and I said, and I said okay. Repeat after me, <laughs> Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I'm serious, and he got saved. He's saved today. He lives in Colorado Springs, and in fact, three years later, he's the one that came up and led me back to the Lord. Isn't that crazy? Doesn't God have a sense of humor? So what I'm telling you is there's no excuse for us not to be the people God wants us to be. Amen. We can do great things even though we struggle, even though everything isn't perfect. Amen. Amen. <laughs> this is the God that we serve. Amen. Ron Jones was my pastor, first pastor. He always wanted to set up a tent. I probably told this story before, but he's always wanted to set a tent up. He just believed that that would bring revival. We got this tent. I remember it was a nightmare setting it up. None of us knew what we were doing. We broke, I think, seven sledgehammer handles trying to put the stakes in just to get the thing up. We finally got this tent up, and Ron appointed me to be the church electrician. I knew nothing. I went to Kmart and bought some cords and lights. Miracle! Plugged it in. The lights came on. But I, I hadn't grounded anything. And I'll never forget as Joe Weidinger was preaching about the third night, you know, and he'd only been saved a few weeks, and, uh, and, and he's preaching, no, he's got the mud. As long as he stayed on that wood platform, he was fine. But it had been raining, and I'll never forget. He stepped off that platform into that wet sawdust. And when he did, all of a sudden, man, that mic in his hand came alive. <laughs> and Joe, he's, wow! He starts leaping and jumping and dancing around the deal. He jumps back up on that platform because he was being electrocuted. I wanted to go and shove him off again. It was the most exciting part of the whole service. I'll never forget, as long as I live, the last that he cut, this thing had been a nightmare. Every nut in town had come. Amen. I remember the snake lady that hissed and crawled up the altar. And that was one of the few that responded. <laughs> the problem was she thought it was the Holy Ghost. She wasn't coming to get saved. Uh, uh, Ronnie's trying to pray, Gets, get everybody out of there. I can tell a hundred stories about that tent. And in this one last lady, the last lady he's going to pray for, she had picked the perfect spot. She's standing there in a puddle of water. <laughs> and as Ronnie came up with that mic in his hand, you can already picture it, can't you? And as he reached out and his hand got about a quarter of an inch from her forehead, there's this... <laughs> and this flash of a light... And this lady begins to go, Woo! Woo! I felt it! I felt it! And she took off running. <laughs> uh, we almost had to extend the revival. Hallelujah. People ran to the altar. Afterwards, she came up to Ron. And she said, she said, I've been prayed for by Oral Roberts. I've been prayed for by Kenneth Copeland. But I've never felt the power of God like I did tonight. <laughs> Ron, Ron didn't have the courage to tell her. Ma'am, it was just Arizona public service. <laughs> Amen. He just looked at her and said, well, well, praise God. <laughs> praise God. I'm glad you felt it. What am I saying? I'm saying we're qualified to bring revival. We're qualified to bring revival, even though we're a mess. Let, let me close with one final scripture and one final story. In John 21, 15, can you imagine Peter? God, what would have, what would have it, to betray Christ, to, to have been prophesied he would and said, I'll never do it, and to do it three times. 
And yet, when Jesus comes to him in John 21, 15, listen to this. He says, so when they had died, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he saith unto him, yea, Lord, you know that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lambs. He saith to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He says unto him, feed my sheep. And he saith unto him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved. Can you imagine? You know, I, I think he's wondering, does Jesus think I'm a liar? Can all he remember is the sin I made, the mistakes I made. He says, because he said unto him a third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus says what? Feed my sheep. What am I telling you this morning? Even though you're a mess, Jesus, what does he want from us? He wants us to help each other. He wants us to love each other. He wants us, even though we're a mess, to feed his sheep. You hear what I'm saying this morning? One of my favorite stories I close with is Omar Lopez told us several years ago. And I've never forgot it. A true story, I guess, of a guy that was in a large American city. I don't remember what the city was. Amen. But he was late coming home. He had to work. And it was kind of an important night, and so he took a shortcut that he really almost always avoided through a park. And the reason was in major cities, parks at night can be where homeless hang out, where the rapes can happen, thieves can be, you know. And so he's rushing through the park as it's in the dark, and sure enough, he hears something happening in a bush that's near the deal. It's obvious somebody's being violated, something is going on. This guy's not a big guy, just a little guy. He wasn't a thug, wasn't somebody that had ever done much of this. And in his heart, he says, I'm, I'm just going to, I can't do anything. I better run. He probably has a knife or a gun. But then he just can't. He can't. And so he stops, and he makes a bunch of noise. And he says, I'm coming in there. I'm coming in there. I got a knife. And uh, all of a sudden, he hears somebody take off running. And yet he can still hear somebody is struggling in the bushes. And he says, are, are you all right? And then a girl's voice rings out. Daddy? Daddy, is that you? And he goes and finds his daughter, who had almost been raped. But because he stopped, and did what he didn't want to do, he saved his daughter's life. Oh, God, I can't even imagine what it would have been like to have gone home that day and your daughter not to show up or to come home violated. But because he stopped, and I want to tell you, the Holy Ghost is trying to get us to understand we can rescue people from hell. We, even though we're not perfect. In fact, some of us are broken. Some of us are wounded. But we are still loved. And we have a message that's bigger than our experience. And will you let the Holy Spirit speak into lives that are being violated? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, we ask you. God, remind us not of who we are, but of who you are. God, remind us of the power that is in this building. God, of forgiveness and salvation. Of the desperate need in these times, in these last days, for a people, God, that will simply, even though <coughs> imperfect, will stand and be honest and, and say, I'm not perfect, but my God's perfect. And I can point you in a direction. And I ask you this morning, how many of you feel the Holy Ghost dealing with you? Amen. To take a stronger stance, maybe a louder voice, would you just raise your hand? Amen. Father, we just pray. We pray. 
We pray for everyone that's here, that God, we'd get honest and know that we've never been perfect. We'd never be perfect. But God, you are perfect. God, you take and you can draw a straight line with a crooked stick. And we ask you this week, use us, God, in a fresh way in a way that we maybe even haven't experienced of late, to remind us of the power of who we are. Well, heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. Maybe someone here has slipped in and you're not saved, but you'd like to get saved this morning. You'd lift your hand. You'd put it up, put it down. You'd say, amen. Pray with me. Pray with me. Amen. I would love to give my life to Christ. Amen. Or maybe you're backslidden. You've just drifted away. You would say, I need to renew my commitment to Christ. You'd raise your hand, put it up, put it down. We would pray with you. Amen. Amen. We'd ask the Lord to touch and renew. Let me ask this. I'm going to pray a prayer. A couple of raise their hands here about renewing their commitment. But maybe you're here, you're saved. There's no doubt about that. But you, you know you're saved, but you have not been as obedient as you know you should be. Amen. And you've used the excuse. Well, when I get my act together, when I deal with this, then I'll do it. And you would say this morning, you're going to recommit yourself to a fresh move towards God. You would raise your hand and say, you're talking to me, Pastor. Would you just raise your hand? Amen. 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 Many. Let's pray this prayer together. It's all the same whether we first begin to serve God. Amen. We just ask for forgiveness and for the Holy Spirit to fill and strengthen us. And it's the same every step forward is that same washing of our spirit and of our soul. We do it through repentance and by simply asking for strength. Amen. For forgiveness for us and for power to give our voice clarity. If you'd like, pray this with me. Especially you recommitting your life. Pray this, but all of us here that raised our hand, let's pray this prayer. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I ask you, forgive me. I'm a mess. But I thank you that you died for messed up people. And I receive forgiveness and I receive the power of the Holy Spirit to change, to help to strengthen me and I receive it now and I thank you for your love and your assurance now just in your own way begin to thank the Lord father we just give you glory we thank you father for your